everyone, I am Rebecca from Chemnitz, and today we're going to talk about depth of shade, or the number of grams of dye per 100 grams of fiber. It's a great way to compare one color to itself. It's a way to also give a more numerical value to the intensity of a particular color. Uh, but we're going to talk a little bit about this and when it is a little bit more accurate and when it might not be as accurate. But before we jump into a little bit of some math conversation, not a lot, this isn't super math heavy today, but before we jump in, I do want to give a huge shout out and thank you to today's lab partner, Bernie Crum. Bernie, thank you so much for being my lab partner today. I've done a number of different videos where I've talked about depth of shade, including a video where I showed that the depth of shade is a comparison of a color to itself. It's not really useful to compare one color to another. Because a premix pastel at a really high depth of shade, like eight grams of dye per 100 grams of yarn, is still gonna be less bright than a color like true black at a 0.1% depth of shade, or 0.1 grams of dye per 100 grams of yarn. But today, I want to showcase using the same dye mixture, the same dye recipe, but with two different techniques. So we're going to be mixing up a dye blend and we're going to be kettle dyeing some of it, which will really give us the depth of shade of the mixture that we're creating. But then we're going to take that same amount of dye and dip dye some yarn into it. And so the recipe and the total number of grams of dye per 100 grams of yarn are going to be exactly the same in the two situations, but the colorways are going to be different. And in the dip dyed skein, we're going to have some color that may match our kettle dyed, but some of it might be a little bit deeper and some of it also might be a little bit paler. And so I wanted to do this comparison because you can think about the total amount of dye that you want to add, but when you have a dip dyed skein, it's hard to say what the depth of shade is. You can say the recipe, um, but on part of the yarn, the yarn that goes in first, you're going to have the equivalent of a higher depth of shade, and then the part of the yarn that goes in last, you're going to have an equivalent of a much smaller depth of shade uh, because of the way the color goes through. And I thought that we would do this today using a color blend, a blend of two colors, because well, then maybe we might see some breaking with the dip dyeing and that could be pretty fun. But I can also then talk a little bit about when you have a mixture, you can talk about the total depth of shade. So the total number of grams of dye per 100 grams of yarn. But then you can also talk about the depth of shade of each individual component, uh, which can be helpful for dealing with a recipe. And so there's different ways that you can think about that. But anyway, that is our plan. Just a little bit of math, I promise. <laughs> so I already said when we have a 1% depth of shade, that's one gram of dye per 100 grams of yarn. And even when I'm mixing my own blend of colors, I still like to think about it as a 1% depth of shade because that's the total amount of dye per volume of yarn that I'm using. But then I might personally just write down the recipe slightly different. So today we're gonna do a four to one ratio of blue to pink, or it'll be 80% blue, 20% pink. And so we could define this colorway instead of saying, you know, it's a 1% depth of shade, we could say, okay, it's a 0.8% depth of shade of blue and a 0.2% depth of shade of pink. And so that's a way that you can think about it to break it down to figure out how much dye of each of the colors you might need to measure out. But I guess for me, I prefer to just be like, okay, the mixture is 80% blue, 20% pink, because then whatever depth of shade, if I go smaller or bigger, I can then figure out the ratios from there, and I find that to be a little bit easier to think about. But this isn't really the important part today. The important part is the fact that we're gonna be looking at a depth of shade and comparing it to dip dyed, and really saying that the depth of shade really does refer to the more tonal aspect of the color versus something like dip dyeing. But of course, you can dye say a portion of a skein, like 10% of the skein, a 1% depth of shade in that area. And there are ways that you can calculate and play around with that, which I have less experience with, but 
Thinking about the amount of dye going onto the amount of yarn can be very, very helpful. The two dye colors we're gonna play with today are Dharma Acid Dyes in Extreme Blue and Fluorescent Fuchsia. And there's a chance, because this pink is a lot slower to absorb, that we could see some breaking with dip dyeing, or we might not. But overall, I don't know if the color will be fairly purple. I think it might be in the blurple category. Extreme Blue is super, super intense. But I thought that this would still be a very fun uh, way to start playing um, with these colors. And I know combinations that, that I can make with this fluorescent fuchsia that do break, but I wanted to stay away from the navy and fluorescent fuchsia that I've played with a lot and try a slightly different combination here today. I put on my deluxe rubber respirator mask, safety glasses, and gloves to start measuring out these dyes to make a stock solution. Now, I could have made 1% stock solutions of each dye separately and then measured out the dye to combine it, but I really just wanted to make a custom premixed color for today, so we're going to be blending these all together in one stock that is my own custom blend. So to make 500 milliliters of this 1% stock solution, which is one gram of dye total, per 100 milliliters. I measured out four grams of the extreme blue acid dye and one gram of fluorescent fuchsia. And I kept the colors separate when I started to dissolve them, but the plan was to eventually combine them together so that way it would be one complete mixture. But I did use separate cups when we started. I dissolved them with hot tap water and then brought the total volume, the total combined volume, up to 500 milliliters. So then we have a total of five grams of dye total, one pink, four blue, dissolved in 500 milliliters. And then we can treat this for the purposes of this video, just like we would treat any other 1% stock solution, um, where if we wanted to have a 1% depth of shade, we would measure out 100 milliliters of this mixture. As soon as I had mixed up our 1% stock, I went ahead and measured out two aliquots of 100 milliliters and two of 50 milliliters for the four skeins of yarn I plan to dye in today's video. And you can see that this was done not in the neatest way. So I have an extra skein of yarn uh, here <laughs> that I am using uh, to help clean up some of this extra dye because why not leave no dye behind. This is a skein of Nitpick Stroll Fingering Weight Yarn. It's 75% superwash merino wool, 25% nylon. Even though this color is 20% pink, it is still very, very blue. I do maybe see some pink hints in here breaking, um, and we'll play around with this yarn more uh, probably at the end of the video. But now let's get our dye bath set up so we can start dyeing our first skeins. I have two dye pots here. They both have 16 cups of tap water. And then I'm gonna add two tablespoons of white vinegar to each for the start. And then to this, we are gonna add 50 milliliters of our color to each one, uh, rinsing out the cup as needed, which since things are cold, that is really nice and easy to do. And then in one of these kettles, we will kettle dye our yarn, and in the other one, we will dip dye. Um, but I'm starting off the conditions very similar in each of them, not because, oh, we need this to be the way things are for the best comparison, um, but yeah, I just thought that it would be pretty helpful. So let's go heat up these dye baths, uh, and then we're gonna dye some yarn that I pre-soaked. We're gonna dye two different Knit Picks yarn lines today. Uh, we're gonna start off by dyeing some DK weight, 100% superwash merino wool. This is Swish DK. And then when we're gonna switch to double the amount of dye, the one gram of dye in each pot, we will use some Knit Picks Stroll Fingering Weight yarn, which is 75% superwash merino wool, 25% nylon. And there's just a tiny bit of dye left here in these cups then I can just uh, wipe up with our little yarn mop, because why not? To cattle dye, I'm gonna wanna make sure that I have my tongs nearby so that way we can stir. 
the yarn up nice and good. I have squeezed out most of the water from our pre-soak and we are going to go in quickly. I'm holding on to the tie, but we're going to stir things to try to get somewhat more even coverage. Now, because things are hot, there will be tonal variation in here, uh, but this is going to be a more accurate representation of the depth of shade for our color mixture than the dip dyed skein, even if we have some variation of color in here. But I suppose if we wanted the most accurate uh, representation of the color, then we probably should have set it up cold, but since we may reuse this dye bath, we have things nice and warm. But yeah, I see some nice, beautiful tonal variation in there. And I'm curious, now that the yarn has been in here for a tiny bit, a lot of the color has cleared. I'm just seeing some pinks left. And this just means that the dip dyeing that we're gonna do next should go pretty quickly, which is always good to know. But anyway, we're gonna heat this for 30 minutes. Uh, and then we'll come back and see if all the pinks have cleared, which they may not have, but we'll see. Sometimes those fluorescent pinks really need to be in the dye bath and as the yarn cools to absorb completely. But I'm gonna stir up this pot really well. We're not at a boil, but it is warm. And so we're gonna start dip dyeing. And once again, I squeezed out almost all of the water from our pre-soak. And now we are gonna just little by little move and dip our yarn into the pot, adding a little bit more little by little, but that's gonna give us at the bottom a much deeper color than we had in our other pot. Now I do wanna bring, as I reach for it, this spoon over, and I'm just keeping an eye on the amount of color that is left in the pot to know, okay, do I wanna go a little bit slower with the dipping or a little bit faster? But dipping just one skein of yarn um, is a bit easier <laughs> than when I do two because it's not quite as heavy. But you can see that as I add more um, and more, um, I'm wiggling the yarn as I'm going in because that will help the dye get to the center of the skein and it's going to help separate the strands a little bit more uh, because sometimes that can be kind of hard to do but you can see that we've got a deeper blue at one end and it's getting lighter and lighter and as I go in you can see that we've got pinks in there I think we will see breaking because those pinks may not be binding nearly as quickly as the other colors and let's see there's not a lot of pigment left. There's definitely still gonna be some blues left in there, but we also have a lot of pinks. And we're nearly towards the end here. See how much pinker that is? Whether or not the breaking will really stick, I don't know. We've basically added the whole thing, so I'm gonna add the rest here. It depends on how quickly the pinks and everything absorb, I suppose. But even if we don't end up with breaking, we should end up with more of a range in hues here than what we had uh, with our first colorway, with our tonal colorway. But who knows? Uh, maybe the deepest color here won't feel that much darker. Um, it all just depends. But certainly we have color in here that is lighter. Um, but yes, I'm going to add more acid here. I'm going to add another two tablespoons of white vinegar and I'm just going to lift and lower to distribute the acid. We did have some blue left when he put it all in, but I do think we may end up seeing some breaking. Maybe I could have captured it a little bit better if I was a little bit slower with the dipping, but again, today the breaking is just a little bit of a bonus. But I'm now going to let this heat for 30 minutes. And even though we are going well with our kettle dyed yarn, I'm also going to add two tablespoons of white vinegar, not because it needs to be kept equal, but because I'm hoping that might help those residual pinks bind a little faster, but I know I'm probably gonna need to let the yarn cool off completely in the pot, so we may as well have more acid while we start this timed uh, of heating. The 30 minutes are up, and let's see how we are doing. There's just a hint of pink in there, which 
honestly is not bad because we do have a fair amount of pink and the pink by itself, even at a 0.2% depth of shade with no other color would be much, much deeper than that. I am gonna turn off the heat and leave the yarn in here to cool for a bit, but I don't feel the need to add any more acid. And I'm gonna go ahead and also turn off the heat on our dip dyed skein, but where is our tie? Here we go. Okay, and we still absorbed a fair amount of color at the light end. I don't really see breaking. And so, <laughs> this might not be as dramatic of a difference as I was originally hoping for. We do have a paler and deeper end though. It's just not quite super dark to super light. There's a hair more pink in here, but still not very much. And again, I'm gonna leave the yarn in here to cool completely. So I think for our next game to have a little bit more drama, we'll start with more acid in the pot and we can even reuse the same dye pot even though I'm gonna let it cool off for a little bit first. Uh, so that way the colors will strike a little faster and we can get more, more drama in our separation of color. You know, it's okay. Sometimes things end up being a little more subtle than we planned, but actually it looks like those residual pinks have cleared really nicely and maybe we'll get more drama in with our next round. Let's remove the kettle dyed. And I'm gonna reuse these same dye baths for the next round. They are still pretty warm, but we'll heat them up again. But this is our 0.5% depth of shade of our custom color. But the only thing I will do before we add more dye is I will wipe the edges. The differences between these two colorways are subtle. This is a hair darker then the 0.5% this is a hair lighter than 0.5%. It might be a little more dramatic once the yarn is washed and dried. And our kettle dyeing pot is warm, but not hot. And I think we will go ahead and add all of the yarn in just a moment. I am rinsing out the, hundred, the cup that had the 100 milliliters of our dye blend with just some tap water. We'll stir things up. And now I'm coming over with our 100 grams of Knit Picks Stroll Fingering Weight Yarn. As I said, it's warm, but not super hot yet, which is nice because this will help us get a little bit more even coverage. If it was hotter, then uh, we would get even more tonal variation, which we will still have tonal variation in here, but we'll be able to get more contrast between this, hopefully, and the dip dyed because we've got pretty good coverage right here. I'll just try to slow down the dip dyeing a bit. And I do want to let this come to a boil uh, before we start dip dyeing. And maybe we will, depending on how quickly things come in, maybe we'll add more acid too. The goal isn't to have like the conditions be completely even Steven, which like for a while I was like, oh, I should try to keep things very similar. But really, we're gonna be comparing the colors in the end. And that is the, important thing. But we do have about four tablespoons of white vinegar in here and we do have twice as much dye as last time. So things might still go slow, but we'll we'll see. But anyway, we will be back uh, in a little bit when we have some movement on the surface here. All right, I am pumped and a little determined to slow myself down a bit. So we're gonna add another tablespoon of white vinegar and coming in with the stroll fingering weight yarn. I'm gonna resist all my urge to dip quickly. <laughs> I feel like I've used extreme blue by itself at a 2% depth of shade before. So I think hopefully we'll be fine. <laughs> oh, you can always tell when I'm thinking because I am not moving the yarn as much. now. There is more surface area uh, with fingering weight yarn. So I do wanna make sure as I'm dipping way too fast, but to move the yarn to get nice coverage. Uh, and yeah, I have no idea. I mean, this definitely feels deeper than what I can see in the other pot, uh, but I am trying to go slow. We don't need to have white at this other end but I would like there to be a little more contrast than what we had last time. Oh my goodness. But yeah, so the, I mean, you when you're comparing a depth of shade to something that's dip dyed, you can't really say the whole thing is the same depth of shade because we're adding more dye per grams of yarn down at one end 
and then a lot less up at the other. And so that's just the way that this happens to be. And so I'm sure that you could do a count, some kind of calculation if you wanted to achieve a certain depth at one end of the yarn. But dip dyeing is so much by feel that I think that that would overall be fairly challenging and difficult to do. Um, it's better to sort of eyeball and see the color that you're getting. And if things are getting to a depth that's where you want it and you don't want things to get any darker, then you can remove the yarn and steam set. So you don't have to always use all of the dye in the pot. And there have been circumstances when I've done dip dyeing and definitely removed some of the yarn before it was completely done because I'm like, okay, that's good. I'm satisfied with the color. But anyway, I really just was hoping, and this, the results might be subtle, but I think we'll still be able to demonstrate that just because you use the same amount of dye in <laughs> to dye the same amount of yarn, the way that you add the dye onto the yarn does matter in terms of the hue that you see with your eyes. And I'm trying. I mean, ooh, look at that. See, there's mostly just pink left but I'm still trying to get as much contrast as possible. And so I'm really, really slowing down here. The thing with dip dyeing with more dye is that not only can it be slower because there's more pigment to bind, but there can at some point be a limit on like the deepest end with how much color will bind overall. So that is something else that can come into the equ equation here. But as we're dipping, the goal is just to go slow and because I want a lot of contrast between the deepest end, which is nice and deep, and the lightest end because the water still looks fairly purpley and so I know that there's a lot of blues in there still. And so attempting to go a little bit slower overall than what I did the first time maybe will help us get uh, more extreme changes in our colors here. Even if the yarn isn't going to look particularly broken. All right, we've got some purple in there and when I add the yarn we do see a little bit of a pale pink. I don't know <laughs> if that'll just turn blue like it did last time or if we're going to capture this breaking this time, but I'm adding more acid and We'll see, we'll see if we capture that change, if we feel the pinks that we have in there or not. Bernie, I really hope that we do because um, I think that this is really, really fun and beautiful as a color. But anyway, I am now going to let this heat for 30 minutes to finish setting the color. It has been 30 minutes and I'm curious how we're doing. Ooh, I see a lot. Well, I mean, not like a millionth amount, but there's a fair amount of pink in here. Um, this is why we did the more concentrated colors second. I am going to turn off the heat, but we will add more acid also. Just add, I think, three tablespoons of white vinegar. And I'm going to leave the yarn in here to cool for a while. That'll help some of that remaining color to bind. The 30 minutes are up over here as well now. And even though we do have more blue that came onto here, I do see hints of the pink. Um, and so that's exciting. But again, we have a fair amount of pink left in the liquid. I'm gonna leave the yarn in here to cool off for a while. Add a little more acid. And once things are cooler, we'll check back in. Finally, we have our Leave No Dye Behind skein, which currently is just a little bit splotched with blues and pinks. I put it in a catering steam pan and covered it up with some water, added a splash of vinegar, and then rinsed out other containers that needed to be rinsed, finally going and getting a, a bit of an eyedropper to drop some of the 1% stock we mixed for this video onto the yarn to just get a more variegated feel. Once I was done adding all the dye, I let the yarn heat for 30 minutes and then washed it off camera. Let's go ahead and wash the DK weight yarn. I'm not expecting any bleeding, but we can also just hope. <laughs> hope that there'll be 
no issue, but so far so good. Um, let's go ahead and add some dish soap. And we'll go ahead and fill up the basin. So if this bleeds, then we know that our next one will bleed because we'll have more dye. But these shouldn't. I've used this color before, and so I don't think it will be an issue. All right. Let's see. Okay, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm feeling pretty good. Let's remove the water. Maybe there's like a tiny hint. Uh, but it's blue, not pink. So that's not that bad. But we're going to do some more rinses and see if it resolves. Okay. Oh, okay. That's fine. There was just a little bit of something to rinse out. So we might see more something come out with the rest. But... I mean, I'm not concerned by anything I see. So, I think I'll rinse it one more time and then we'll put this through the spin dryer, hang it up to dry, and soon we'll remove and wash the sock yarn. The water is still a little bit warm, but I can reach my hands into it. And I'm gonna be a little bad and put the warm yarn into a rinse bath, but you can see almost all of the color has absorbed. Here, that was our dip dyed. Here is our kettle dyed yarn. A hint of pink, but that is all. Now, this is super wash yarn, so I was less concerned about putting it into cold water. Normally, though, you really want to let the yarn cool completely before going to wash it. And what's funny? I don't know if the darkest end of the dip dye feels that much darker. I feel like I picked the wrong dye to really like hammer my point home. But that's okay, we'll just have to try this again another time in another way. Sometimes I try to do a demonstration and I mean, we've got beautiful yarn, it's a lovely color. But sometimes things work the way uh, I anticipate they might work and other times I pick a pigment that isn't as good for dip dyeing because you know, it's but a little bit slower to bind overall, and that is okay. But again, we'll see how things look when they're dry, because we absolutely have a difference in tone here. It's just, you know, is the darkest gonna feel, oh yeah, that's darker than our tonal. It's just everything feels very similar, and everything, since everything is darker overall in appearance when wet, we are seeing a little bit of some bleeding. Um, but since everything appears a bit darker when it's wet anyway, uh, that can make it a little harder with the more saturated colors to see a visual difference. But we did capture some breaking, and I'm very, very excited about that. Um, very excited. So anyway, I'm going to fill this up once again. All right, let's see how we're doing. Yeah, I'm still seeing some blue, but the nice thing is that it is looking paler than it did before, so I'm not feeling very worried. Yeah, I mean, it's really not that bad, but it's still annoying. All right, I'm going to rinse this a few times off camera, and then I'll come check back in. All right, we've had a number of rinses, and we're looking very clear now. So into the spin dryer we go. And I'm gonna wash the leave no dye behind skein off camera. Let's start with our DK weight yarn where we used half a gram of our dye mixture on each of these skeins. But one of them we dyed in a tonal layer at a 0.5% depth of shade. And then the other we dip dyed into the same amount of dye. Now one of the things that's fun is that we do see some hints of pink a little bit in both of the skeins. Otherwise, I'm not sure how much of a difference it makes on the overall color, but it is present. The differences here are subtle, but but the darkest part of our dip dyed skein is darker than the average that we have here on our kettle dyed skein. And the lightest end is definitely lighter. But again, both of these skeins were dyed with the exact same amount of dye. It's the technique that gives us that different intensity on the yarn itself. 
One thing that you could do with sort of a dip dyeing-esque technique is you could dip half of your skein of yarn into a pot with half amount of the dye and kettle dye a portion of the skein to get the depth of shade that you want. Um, but there you are, I guess, limiting the total amount of yarn in the dye bath. And so that's a little bit different than raising and lowering the yarn and getting more of a gradient. When we doubled the amount of dye, so we have a total skein here dyed at a 1% depth of shade of our mixture, and then a skein that we dip dyed into one gram of the mixture. Again, the same amount of dye in both. Here we definitely see some breaking of that blue and pink mixture because we really see pink at one end of that dip dyed skein. If I rearrange the yarn like this, now you can see how deep our color is at the darkest point of our dip dyed skein. And that is darker. It is more saturated than her 1% depth of shade. And I guess the whole point that I'm making here in this video is that when I'm dyeing something that's tonal, I might talk about the depth of shade. And I might use that overall recipe as a starting point for dip dyeing or doing some other kinds of techniques because I know that, all right, that amount of dye on the yarn does absorb pretty well. But when I'm talking about something dip dyed, I might talk about the recipe and say, okay, I used one gram of dye or two grams of dye, what have you, but I don't really think I use the phrase depth of shade as much just because the depth of shade on this yarn varies because right here, the equivalent that we have is more than a gram of dye per 100 grams of yarn. It's just, this might only be five grams of yarn. And up here, we have a lot less. And so it's not really easy to quantify because it is way more qualitative. Whereas depth of shade gives us a way to quantify the color that we're say, seeing here. And so a depth of shade is a comparison of one dye or a dye mixture like we made today to itself on the same yarn base at different amounts. And it's a way to sort of talk about how saturated or unsaturated that particular color is. We did our project today on two different yarn bases. So while we can still say this is a 1% depth of shade, that's a 0.5% depth of shade, and we happen to know that Stroll and Swish DK are very, very similar. And if I was dyeing the same color on both of those yarn bases, it would look nearly identical. Uh, sometimes you do need to take into consideration the yarn base that you're dyeing when you're doing a depth of shade. And one great example of that is when, say, you're dyeing something with, say, silk, because the same amount of dye on a silk blend will often appear visually lighter in the end. Or if you're dyeing a base that has some yak blended in it, it's gonna look a lot deeper because the bare yarn has some more color to it. And so it's for reasons like that where I say that you should be comparing one color to itself on the same fiber content because different blends can have slightly different results. Finally, we have our Leave No Dye Behind skein that we used to wipe up some spills, but then we did dye and add more of this mixture to it uh, to sort of make things more complete. And we have this sort of speckly, variegated, soft colorway here. The little bit of pink that's in here is very, very subtle. Nowhere near as pronounced as the skein on the left, which had a lot more dye, but you can just barely get a hint that there is something not blue in here as well. But the blue definitely is the dominating color that you see. And likely when I list this, I will call it a blue yarn. I am Rebecca from Chemnitz, and I would like to thank Bernie Crumb for being my lab partner for today's episode of Dye Pot Weekly. Bernie, I really hope that you loved this video and the yarn that I dyed for you. I'm excited to play around with this custom mixture because I do have more of it. But anyway, Bernie, thank you again for being my lab partner today. If you would like to learn more about how you can become a lab partner or you want to bring home some fun Chemnitz dyed yarn, head over to the Chemnitz Creations Etsy shop. The shop is filled with hand dyed yarn featured in these videos and it's a really great way to help support the content here. 
I am currently in the process of shipping out some mystery Valentine's Day yarn, and there may still be some more pre-order skeins left in the shop. This yarn is going to come wrapped with a stitch marker, a sticker, and a handmade Valentine by me, and I'm really excited uh, to share the whole video with all of you on Valentine's Day this year. You can find a link to this down in the video description. As much as I love pre-mixed colors, I also really enjoy mixing my own colors. And this is something that I know a lot of other dyers really enjoy to do because, well, for one thing, it's fun. It's fun to have your own colors, but also it can make some of your colorways a little bit more unique. Yes, a lot of us have the same colors and play with it and a lot of us mix them. But if you're making your own recipes and blending your own colors and then those are the things that you use in a lot of your colorways, then you're even less likely to create something that maybe someone else has dyed, which does happen all the time. And this is why I recommend that when you're dyeing yarn, it's best to pull inspiration from say, nature, movies, TV, things that aren't someone else's shop. Of course, I invite all of you to play around, try my recipes and my techniques at home, even though I do encourage you to try to put your own spin on things, because really, that's what all of this is all about. Please subscribe, do all the youtube -y things, that is by far the biggest way you can help support the content here. And thank you so much for watching!